So on this video, we're going to be talking about the structure of the human chromosome or chromosomes in general, but we we'll focus specifically on the way it looks in humans. And one thing you should know, of course, is that DNA is this double helix molecule that calls upon itself to form structures like chromosomes, and that chromosomes are inside of the nucleus of, of the cell, and that we have 23 different pairs of these chromosomes. We learn about that when we study cell division in meiosis and mitosis. Now, first thing I want to talk about is that difference between chromosome and chromatin. Remember that when DNA is actually active and the cell is actually doing their normal uh, functions, that DNA is uncoiled, open up, so that it can actually be transcribed or translated into the actual proteins, which is the actual things that you see or the phenotypes. So the DNA, when it's active, it's going to be uncoiled and look like a spaghetti, bunch of little fibers spread around the nucleus, and that's what we call chromatin. Now, chromosomes are only visible during mitosis and meiosis, especially during metaphase when they're completely coiled up already after prophase is done. And they look like these X-shaped molecules, which are actually two copies of each chromosome. Remember, because by the time you get to prophase and metaphase, the chromosome has doubled. And so each chromosome is actually only half of that. But that you've doubled it because you're going to do cell division and you want each cell to have each half of when it splits up. So that's why it looks double like that. But that chromosome molecule is basically a package of the chromatin that is spread out throughout the cell's normal processes. But let's talk about how that structure actually works or the levels of organization of the chromosome molecule or the chromatin molecule. So we all start with this uh, double helix of a, of a double-stranded DNA molecule. So DNA is like a strand, but there's two of those paired up next to each other. And that strand coils upon itself to make a staircase-like double helix molecule. Now, that molecule will coil itself around a structure that's called a histone. And you can see that over here. There are histones, and there are different versions of these histones across nature, but in humans, we have this histone, which is a combination of two protein structures. One that looks like a circle. I think of it as like, you know, when you get the garden hose and you roll it up around a roll so that the garden hose is like easy to manage and get organized. So the core of the, of the, eight, the histone molecule is eight different subproteins, sub which gather together and form a surface around which the DNA double-strand helix can coil itself around and stay in an organized shape. Then you have histone H1, which is a second part of a histone molecule, which actually serves the purpose of kind of holding that coil in place. So I think of it as like when you know when you get the cables and you coil them around and then you get one of those zip ties and tie it around so that it stays in place. And so this histone molecule is actually what holds the DNA cord around these risk molecules. So, but around these histone molecules, you also have nucleosomes because each one of these histones can connect to other histones to form a nucleosome. You see one of those right there. So this histones is basically several histones put together will make a nucleosome. Now, if you get several of these nucleosomes and you start putting them together, you make what we call, we call a DNA coil. You can see that here, DNA coil. So here again, you have the DNA around the histone, and then they start coiling around other histones to form a coil. Now, as that coil coils around other coils and coils even more, we call that a supercoil. So somewhere around here, we have a supercoil. And that supercoil will, will form the actual structure of either the chromatin or the, chrom or the chromosome, depending on what it is. But all of this is one continuous long DNA molecule, which is called around itself. Each one of those molecules can be miles and miles and miles across. In fact, if you were to get all the chromosomes inside of each cell, it can go around the Earth several times. And if you were to get all the DNA in your body, you can go back and forth from the sun several times. So we were talking about a lot of DNA inside of your body, all of it organized in this method. So uh, again, remember that chromatin is when the DNA is spread out, so it's not packaged. It doesn't, some parts of it stays in supercoil, some parts uncoil more and actually leave the strand visible, uh, depending on what parts are active and what parts are not active. And remember that that's actually a combination of those subunits which make a ball around which the DNA can coil around, and then the H1 histone, which traps that coil around the, the, those balls so that they can stay in the right place. So the chromatin, it can be looked in the chromatin fiber, and at, at 30 nanometers of diameter, that's how thick it is. But then as you form the supercoils, it gets thinner and thinner, and you get to something like a nucleosome, and then to the histone, and then finally to the DNA double helix. Now this look at the way the chromatin looks in the cell. 
like I said, it looks like a spread out bunches of DNA are in the nucleus. Now, when that claws around, it will look like this, like a chromosome, and you actually have 23 different pairs of that sitting in, in the cell once prophase is completed. And you can also see in this picture here how the nucleus, the entire nucleus, is about 10 micrometers of size. And inside the nucleus, you have a DNA molecule that's about 2 nanometers across as a double helix. But then by the time you get to the histone, it's getting thicker and thicker and more coiled up. And that's by the time you get to the nucleosomes, it's going to be 30 nanometers across, so it's a much more coiled up. By the time you get to the coils, you're talking about 300 nanometers across, and the super coils will be about 700 nanometers across. By the time you get to the, to the actual chromosome, it's 1,400 nanometers across. So you can see how the DNA is being compacted more and more, and more of the DNA is fitting in that chromosome. Imagine how many times something that's 2 nanometers across can be compacted in something that's 1,400 nanometers across, especially when you consider that it's going around these coiled up structures that we call histones, which then form nucleosomes, which then form coils, supercoils, and fibers, which can either be chromatin fibers or even more coiled into the, in the actual chromosome fibers. Now, I know this is all a bunch of new language, so you need to review this in order to make sure that you understand exactly what's going on. Now, when you look at the actual composition of a chromosome, it's remember that each chromosome is actually a singular linear strand of, of DNA. But that chromosome gets doubled during the S phase of the cell cycle to form that familiar X-shaped chromosome that you guys see over here. And that these chromosomes have, are full of genes, or each piece of the chromosome is equi equivalent to one specific instruction to form a specific protein that's called a gene. Now, the basic structure of the, of the chromosome is that we, we went through in the coil, but the overall structure will be that. It will have a P arm and a Q arm. The P arm is also called petite for short arm. And the Q arm is the long arm uh, because the centromere, which is the middle of the chromosome, is not exactly in the middle. It's a little higher than the middle in most of the chromosomes. And so you're going to have the P or short arm or the Q or long arm. And then you're going to have at the corners even of the chromosome, both on the top and on the bottom, you call, call those corners the telomeres, a region of, of DNA code that's redundant and unnecessary, and it's there only to protect the actual DNA that matters from degradation. We're going to be talking about that when we talk about DNA synthesis and replication on our next topic of the DNA uh, genetic series. So that is the basic structure of a chromosome molecule, right? Now, the human carrier type includes 23 of these, 23 pairs of these chromosomes in the nucleus of the cell. So you get one of these chromosomes, you get uh, one from dad and one from mom from each type. And then you get 23 total types and for 46 chromosomes in total. So you have what is called a carrier type. A carrier type is a picture of the human genome or all the chromosomes in a person's cell lined up in order by size. It's very important. So notice that chromosomes number one are bigger than two, then three, then four, and so forth. And there are karyotype families, you know, uh, also in the genome. So one through five is a family, six through twelve is another, and so forth. Now, you're going to have all of these chromosomes lined up together. You're going to make the karyotype. And you can see that uh, they're color-coded in, in, in this drawing, drawings. And this is actually what we call a cytogenic map when you color code the, the chromosomes. And we'll talk about that uh, later in this lecture series. But I also wanted to point out that there's a difference between the female and the male karyotype. Notice that there are 22 chromosomes which are called the autosomes or the chromosomes in charge of uh, performing or orienting the normal activities of your body. So they determine everything about who you are. And then you have a last group of chromosomes, which are called the sex chromosomes. Now, in the case of the, of the female, they have a paired X chromosome group. So they have two X chromosomes, and you can see that right there. In the case of the female, they have a paired X chromosome group, right? In the case of the male, they have an X and a Y. So the females will have two Xs, but the males will have an X and a Y. So that is what makes the difference between a male and a female. In fact, all, all embryos, we talked about this in when we talked about the human sexual reproduction, are female unless they're exposed to the testosterone, which is produced uniquely by the Y chromosome. So it's the Y chromosome that's going to make someone 
a male. So the presence of a Y chromosome turns the organism into male, in this case, of the human chromosomes. Remember, the carrier type includes 22 autosomes, one and then pairs of autosomes, and then one pair of sex chromosomes. For a total of 46 chromosomes total, males are XY, females are XX. All right? So you see here the female carrier type with the XX at the end, and then the male carrier type with the XY at the end. I also wanted to point out that compared to the X, the Y is much smaller. It has much less DNA than the Y does. So females do have more DNA than men do. All right? Now, how do you determine the gender of the baby? Well, when the f females can only donate X, right? So when, if you look at this point of square, the females can only donate X. That means the, the mothers can only make uh, tell the child to be X. So they can't do anything about that. But males can either donate an X or a Y. So when a gamete is being made, it's going to be a 50-50 shot of being one or the other doing that separation of homologs that happens during anaphase one of the of, of the meiosis process if the male donates an x you're going to make an xx because it's going to combine with the x of the female which is all it can give and this is going to be a girl so that's going to be a girl because the male donated an x if the male donated a y or this was a sperm that had a y chromosome in it you're going to get an xy and then that's going to be a boy which means it's always a 50 50 shot of being either male or female and that who determines the gender is the Y chromosome, which we see from the male dad. Which means males are the ones who determine the, the gender of the children. Whatever the male donated, which is ironic since historically females were blamed for not producing male offspring. But I also something else that's interesting that you see a 50-50 percentage of, uh, of a chance of, of getting either male and female. But when you look at the actual ratios of male and female children in the world, you're going to see there's a lot more females than males. Well, there's several reasons for that. Females are more resilient than males genetically, and which means that the fetuses uh, and the embryos actually develop better and more stably. They survive better the pregnancy process. So there's less stillbirths or failed or spontaneous abortions or things like that among females. Then, more males die during childbirth than females do. Just a fact. More males die in infancy than females do. All right. So uh, infancy mortality. There are more children to die uh, on male side than female side. And then once adults, historically, males have been involved with more dangerous occupations than females did. From hunting to war to other things like that, males have always been involved in more dangerous situations than females did. Also, males are more prone to several types of diseases than females are. And so when you end up getting is that by the time you get to 78 years old, oh, this is the other thing. Females tend to live longer than males also. They have longevity is longer. So by the time you get to the end of, if you compare at all stages of the human life, females seem to have an, a genetic advantage to males, which means that you're going to have more females than males in the population, although the chances should be 50-50. But that's how it should be, because you don't need that many males. One male can inseminate multiple females, but each female can only carry one, maybe two babies at most at the same time if accidentally you make twins. So having several females is important because of the human population, it basically it's designed to carry one baby at a time. So you need a lot of child bears, but not necessarily that many males, which can inseminate th uh, thousands of females across their life, potentially. Of course, you need both males and females because uh, to, to sponsor the sexual reproduction. We talked about that on the human sexual reproduction video. But we could have more females than males. All right? All right. That's the structure of the human chromosome and the human genome or carrier type. And I'll see you guys in the next video where we talk about the chromosomal theory of inheritance.